Well, good morning, everyone. Well, I want to acknowledge John and Meg Glass. John, you just wave your hand there. John and Meg and their son John are here visiting us. And John's going to be speaking to us tonight. Now, they've been serving as missionaries. John is a pastor of a church. Um, they've been in France and Geneva, Switzerland, uh, for ever since I was a boy, um, more than three decades. And uh, we heard that they were coming to a wedding here in South Africa, and so Tim and Robin and I, who all know them, all uh, collaborated together to ambush them and convince them to come to uh, preach here tonight in our evening service, and uh, very much looking forward to that. Um, and John has an incredible testimony about how he went from this globe-trotting young guy, and God apprehended him and brought him to repentance and faith, uh, and he'll be sharing some of that with us tonight as he brings God's word to us, so I encourage all of you to come and, and join us this evening for our evening service. I know you'll be very encouraged by that time together. Well, it has been a delight for my family to be here at Antioch. I think this is our ninth Sunday here, but it feels like so much longer. You've been very welcoming to us, and it's been a joy to start getting to know so many of you. Um, we're very thankful to see your love for the Lord and your love for one another. It's, it's so evident, uh, and we are just rejoicing at all that's happening here. This is a busy church. There's much going on, uh, and... Over these weeks, I've been able to see and observe much of that activity and notice how many different people are serving in different places, doing different things to make all of that ministry happen. Um, it's, it's been a joy for me to watch. But I also know that in every church, there are many different attitudes towards service. There, there are always going to be some people who are very involved and some people who are not involved at all. Uh, there are some people who are very eager and excited to serve, and some who are weary and, and burned out. Um, some people are wondering if they should start serving. Others are wondering if they should quit serving. And I don't know where you are in that, and where we are, but I know that in any church there are usually people in all of those groups. And so today, this passage that we look at is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, it's really a passage that speaks to all of us. And no matter where you are on the spectrum of service within the church, this passage is an encouragement. This has profoundly affected my own thinking about service over the years, and, and I trust that no matter which group you find yourself in, that this will be a blessing to you as well. Well, we're going to focus specifically on 1 Peter 4, verses 10 through 11, but I'm going to introduce it by starting from verse 7. So let me ask if you could stand. We're going to read... 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11. Please listen as I read. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please bow with me. God in heaven, we are so grateful for your word, for how it teaches us. Lord, it speaks to our hearts. Lord, it addresses our heart towards service and what that means. Lord, I pray that you will help us as we look at this passage together to, to understand your thinking, your heart and attitude towards service. Lord, I acknowledge my own inadequacy, Lord, to be able to, to do this accurately, but also acknowledge your sufficiency, Lord, and just uh, commend myself to you, Lord, enable my tongue as a speaker. Lord, I pray for the ears of these hearers alike, that you will help us to behold your beauty and your grace on display in this passage, Lord, that we may become more like you through this time together. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, since we're coming partway through 1 Peter, we're parachuting really into chapter 4, I want to take a few minutes to look at the context together. 
And as we do that, I hope you'll see why this passage is so relevant to us today. Peter is writing to Christians who are living in difficult days. We see in chapter 1, verse 1, that Peter is writing to Christians who are scattered in many different places across what is now modern-day Turkey. And these are people being persecuted for their faith. They're being persecuted for being Christians under Emperor Nero. The Roman historian Tacitus tells us Nero would do all kinds of things to torture and kill Christians. He would clothe them in animal skins and then let wild dogs tear them to pieces until they died. He would nail them to crosses. And most famously, he would burn them alive as human torches in his own garden parties while he rode around on a chariot presiding over it. These brothers and sisters that Peter is writing to all are aware of what's going on. They're recognizing this could happen to them at any time. They're suffering in ways that we honestly can't really relate to or or imagine. Some of them have fled from their homes. Some of them have run to other places. But even then, the fear of persecution and death followed them. And so Peter's writing this epistle to encourage them, to really strengthen their faith in this time of intense persecution. It's interesting to note how he does that. What he doesn't do is downplay their persecution. He doesn't try to say that, yeah, you're not suffering, or to say, it's going to be okay, or to say, it's really not as bad as you think it is, you're exaggerating it. In fact, if anything, he makes it even more uh, prominent. These trials, he says, are various. They're going to happen in a lot of different ways. He calls it a fiery ordeal that's happening among them. But as he lists out their sufferings in this book, he also gives a longer list, a fuller list. And it's the list of the blessings that God has given to them as well. What Peter does is he shows them that, yes, while they're suffering, there's something much greater happening. There's something much bigger happening. That God is doing things through them, for them, and will continue to do them, continue to offer these things to them long after this life. Some of these things they have now. Some of them they look forward to. He does all of these things to give them hope. The point of this book is to help these Christians to understand how to conduct themselves when everything falls apart. How to live in a world of suffering. How to live in times of hardship. And that is so helpful for us. And let's look at verse 7, what we read just a moment ago. As we jump in there, we see that again. The end of all things is near. Now what Peter means when he says the end of all things is he's not talking about the end of their hardships. He's not talking about the end of the persecutions. We know from history that the Roman persecutions would continue for more than 200 years after this. After Nero was Domitian and Trajan and Diocletian and other names that were famous for finding terrible and gruesome ways to put Christians to death. What Peter is talking about when he's talking about the end of all things being near is the Lord's return. He talked about it in chapter 2, verse 12. He says it's the day of visitation, that that's at hand, that it could happen any time now. The Lord may return any day. It's imminent. The people in Peter's day were waiting for Christ's return just as we are today. And it's even nearer for us than it was for then. And so Peter continues in verse 7, Therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Other translations give those same commands. Be self-controlled, or be serious and disciplined so that you can pray. Be clear-minded, be watchful in your prayers. And if you try to put yourself in the shoes of someone who's suffering persecution and try to imagine what sort of advice you might get in a letter from a godly Christian You might expect something like that. Okay, keep calm. Be sober-minded. Keep your wits about you. Don't do anything rash. Keep calm and keep praying. Carry on in prayer. And as you think about everything that's going on in the world, you might expect maybe it would even go further. You know what? Keep a low profile. Keep your wits about you, but watch your back too. Don't take any unnecessary risks. Kind of limit your exposure to everything that's going on. Be careful about associating yourself too much with other Christians. Don't take those risks. Let's be honest. How many of you would be at church right now if you knew that there was a chance that at the end of the day you might end up as a human torch? 
But that's not what Peter says. Peter isn't calling his readers to withdraw from gathering together. He isn't calling them to pull out of society. In fact, it's just the opposite. Look at the next three verses. He explains those commands in verse 7 in the next three verses, verses 8 through 10. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Did you see it there? Those three verses have three distinct one another's. Verse 8, love one another. Verse 9, hospitable to one another. Verse 10, serving one another. In other words, what Peter's saying is that when the world is coming to an end, double down on one another. When everything is falling apart, invest in one another. When things are going crazy all around you, put your time in the body, in the church, in serving each other. Love one another. And not just until they sin and then you stop, but to cover a multitude of sins when brothers sin against you. Be hospitable to one another. Literally, this means showing love to strangers and then do it without complaining. In the first service, I was able to embarrass our hosts, the Russells, who've hosted us for more than two months now. Benjamin Franklin once said that guests are like fish. After three days, they start to smell. (laughs) And we've stayed there much longer than three days. We've uh, been able to be with them for more than two months. And they've done it without complaining. Such a great example of this kind of hospitality. We're so thankful for that. And then that last one another, serving one another, is really where we're going to camp out today. This is where we're going to spend our time in verses 10 and 11. We're going to learn how we can serve one another when the world is unraveling. How do we invest in that? We're going to see principles that will help us whether you're weary or zealous, whether you are committed, undercommitted, or overcommitted, wherever you are on that, where can we find encouragement to serve in this world? These verses will point us to right service by centering us around God himself. They point us to God. And so in our passage today, we're going to see three dynamics of a God-centered service to encourage us wherever we fall short. Three dynamics of a God-centered service. The first dynamic is this. God gives us all gifts for service. That's in verse 10. As each one has received a special gift... Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God, in his grace, loves to give gifts. He's the giver of every good and perfect gift, James tells us. And as I said a minute ago, that's one of the themes that Peter highlights in this, is that long list of blessings that God gives to his people that outweighs the smaller list of sufferings. Let's just highlight a few of those to just help us wrap around our mind around the magnitude of these gifts that God's given to his children. Chapter 1, verse 1, grace and peace in the fullest measure. Verse 3, God gives a living hope of resurrection from the dead. And it continues in chapter 1, as we saw in our call to worship this morning, that imperishable, undefiled inheritance that awaits us in heaven. And that protection by the power of God. God gives inexpressible joy that we all have at his coming. God has redeemed us with the precious blood of the Lamb. Chapter 2, God has made us a people who were not a people. He's made us a chosen race, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Chapter 2, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body, on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. And we could keep going on and on, but Peter just is effusive about all the blessings that God has given to his people. And then in our passage today, we see another one. God has given every believer spiritual gifts. That word used in verse 10 is not the normal word for a gift. This is a special gift. The NASB translators put in the word special to highlight that. It's charisma. It's those grace gifts, those gifts that God gratuitously bestows to every believer at the time of conversion, the time of salvation. We receive 
a gift. We see examples of these grace gifts in some of the other passages, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Pastor Tim has preached a phenomenal message on Romans 12 not too long ago, so won't go into that too much. You can find that online. I think it's called Becoming a Charismatic Church. You probably raised some eyebrows with that. But these are gifts that God gives to each believer that are different from our natural abilities. We have natural abilities. God gives us those as well. But he also gives believers something special, something unique. And it comes to us at salvation. Some examples of them from those other passages are teaching, giving, leading, administrating, mercy, and so on. Now in our verse here, we see it's used as gift, singular, but I think it's best really to understand that as a combination of multiple gifts that make one unique blend. I like to think of it as a smoothie. So when we make smoothies, we'll get a lot of frozen fruits and put them all in the blender and mix them up together and you make something. And it's different every time because it depends on what you had more of and what you had less of. Every time it's a little different flavor, a little different variation. And everyone is distinct and unique, but comes together to make one drink that you can enjoy. It's similar here, is that God combines different abilities and, and, and aptitudes into one gift that each of us has. Each one of us has a special blend that is not the same as anyone else's. And then did you notice who this verse says receives these gifts? Everyone. Each one. Each Christian has a gift. If you're a Christian, you have been blessed with a spiritual gift from God. Pretty straightforward. Now sometimes we we don't think of it that way. We often think of people, gifted people, as people who have very prominent gifts. Right? We're thankful for Melissa and Lydia and, and their gift of music and blessing us with that. And we'd say they're gifted. But really, if you're a believer, you are gifted. God has gifted you with a gift. That's what this passage teaches us. Every Christian is gifted. And to take it further, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 50 years or for five minutes. God has gifted you. It doesn't matter what your age or your gender is, what your ethnic or social background are, you have a gift if you're in Christ. You don't need to go to Bible college for four years to get this gift. You don't need to have a spiritual experience to have this gift. This is a gift that God graciously gives to every believer at the time of salvation. If you are in Christ, you have a gift. And this verse also tells us what your gift is for. It's to be employed in serving one another. This gift is not to be used for ourselves, but to be used for everyone else, the people around us. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us it's for the common good. This is why Peter uses the word of a steward, the language of stewardship. We understand that. It's managing something that has been entrusted to our care. Imagine for a minute that somebody entrusted you with an extremely valuable, a priceless musical instrument, say a violin. This violin, they say, is for you to take care of. I'm entrusting it to you with one condition. It needs to be used for ministry. Find ways to use it to build up the church. What would you do with it? What we'd hope is that you'd find ways to get it used, right? And we start thinking, how can I make sure that, that this can be used to build up the body, to evangelize the lost? How can I put this in the hands of musicians who are going to be able to, to take full advantage of its form and shape and, and use it to be able to, to perform the beautiful music that this violin was created to perform? How can I use it to let people be blessed by it? I want people to be able to hear the sounds that this was made to create. Would you get it in people's hands? Would you help find venues for it to be used in? Or would you keep it in the case and put it in a cupboard somewhere and lock it away and just leave it sitting there? The first one is being a good steward. The second is being a poor steward, locking it up, not using it for what it's intended. And our gifts are like that. They're meant to be used. God has given them to us to employ as good stewards. And so the question is, are you employing your gifts? 
Are you putting them to use? Are you serving one another with them? That's what they're intended for. Now, I often hear people say, well, I'm not sure what my gifts are. And if that's you, I'd encourage you to speak to one of your leaders. Talk to a small group leader. Talk to one of the elders. Any one of them would love to help you find what your gifts are. But I'll tell you how they'll probably do it. It's not going to be filling out a questionnaire. It's going to be getting you involved in service and helping you start something. And then coming alongside and saying, hey, brother, that, what you just did, is not your gift. <laughs> Let's find something else, right? And helping steer you to something else. And I praise God for people who've done that in my life, who've helped guide me to, to find areas that are not <laughs> my gifts. But that's how we start to put those things to use. And so if you aren't sure where you're gifted, I encourage you to speak to someone. I know any of the leaders would love to help you with that. Peter also says, this end of this verse, that uh, these gifts showcase God's manifold grace or his varied grace. And the thought there is that God's grace is in many different colors. Literally, this word means multicolored or multifaceted, right? Because, as we saw, God gives each believer a unique blend of gifts. When you start putting them all together, you get this spectrum of colors, right? This mixture that doesn't match anything else in this world, right? That the church begins to display this, this beauty of all these different colors all shining forth at the same time. 1 Corinthians 12 emphasizes that. God gives a variety of gifts, a variety of ministries, and for a variety of effects. But it's one God and one spirit who gives them. And so put together, all of our gifts create this beautiful spectrum of color. But conversely, if we aren't using our gifts, if some of us are holding back, are keeping them in the cupboard, then some of those colors are missing. missing, And the beauty begins to fade. And the, the, the overall impression that that should have for the world begins to be diminished. God gives us all gifts for service. The second dynamic that we see in this passage is that God empowers our service. That's in verse 11a. Tell you a tale of two lawnmowers. In Malawi, my fellow missionary and I both bought lawnmowers. He bought a petrol powered lawnmower. I bought an electric lawnmower. And we began to debate which one of us had made the better decision. And at first, I thought that it was me because we had a nine month long fuel crisis where you couldn't buy petrol. And so Brian's grass got really long and he had to borrow mine. But he got the last laugh because after that came years of load shedding. <laughs> Sometimes 18 hours a day. And my grass got really long. And I had to borrow his lawnmower. And as we joked about it later, we decided that the only ones who really won were the guys who just had the hand-powered slashers that went out to cut their own grass like that. <laughs> They're the only ones whose grass never got too long. <laughs> And the problem for both of us was that each of these machines relied on a supply of something to make the machine work. Petrol, electricity, whatever it was, it needed a supply of that or it wouldn't function properly. And what we see in our passage here next is that God supplies us what we need to make our gifts work properly. He is the supplier. Verse 11a, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. God supplies those things. And we see two different ways there. Peter classifies the spiritual gifts into two different broad categories. Speaking gifts and serving gifts. Every one of us has a gift that falls into at least one of those categories, sometimes both. And it's important not that one is more important than the other, because both of them depend on God's supply for them to work properly. Speaking gifts would involve things like preaching, like teaching, like exhortation and admonition. And of these, Peter tells us, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Now, the word utterances is, is a, a unique word. It sometimes is translated oracles. And it describes the exact words of God. And what that means is not that a preacher doesn't need to prepare and hope that God's just going to zap the words straight through him, 
right? We know that's not the case from other passages. 1 Timothy 5.17 instructs that double honor is given to elders who work hard at preaching and teaching. Preaching and teaching take hard work. There's study and preparation involved. It also doesn't mean that the preacher's words are new revelation. It doesn't mean that what I'm saying right now is on the same level as scripture. It's not. My words aren't infallible like God's words are. And though the Holy Spirit helps us when we preach or teach, it's not the same as the process of inspiration by which God breathed out the words of 1 Peter or 2 Peter. What it does mean, though, is that when I preach, I need to communicate the words that God has already spoken. I need to speak his words. I need his words to come through me. And that's my job when I'm teaching the word of God. It shouldn't be a new idea that I'm communicating, but it should be the message of this book. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He describes his own ministry. In 2 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, he says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul, living in a world where people always came up with new ideas and put those forth, said, I don't have something creative and original to tell you. I'm just going to preach Christ and him crucified. That's the message. And that's what I should be doing, is not showing you how clever I am or coming up with something creative that I've innovated, but point you to Christ. And I think we recognize that in the context of preaching and probably teaching. You've grown up in this church for a while. You've heard that often. But remember, this also applies to other speaking gifts as well, right? So that would also include things like teaching a small group. That would also include counseling and discipleship and admonishment. And in all of those contexts, too, where you're speaking to one another, you should still be speaking the words of God. That doesn't mean that you're just reciting scripture to each other, but that the message that you communicate should be based on God's word, built within a framework of God's word. When we spend our time in our counseling class on Wednesday night, that's what we're doing, is trying to better understand God's word, to help each other to to better know God's thoughts and his way of thinking about life so that we can better address the issues that come up in people's lives. What we don't want to do is just say, well, here's my experience. Try that. You know, here's something that happened to me once. See how that works for you. We want to point people to God's word. Whatever role you have of speaking, you should speak the words of God. But we also see serving gifts here. That includes things like mercy giving, leading, organizing, helping, prayer. And Peter continues, whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So there's an idea that there are two different stores that you can draw from there. You can take strength from God for service or strength from self. And what we're called to do here is the first And I know from my own experience that it's easy to commit to a ministry opportunity and be very excited about all the things that we're going to be able to do for the Lord and then over time drift to a reliance on our own strength. I've often found myself feeling like I'm struggling to serve in a specific way. I feel weary. I feel discouraged. I feel frustrated. And and often when I'm there, eventually I realize, you know, I need to ask the Lord to help me in this ministry And then I ask, why did it take me so long to get to this point? That's where I should have started, right? We should be depending on the Lord for his strength from the very beginning. In every ministry endeavor, no matter how familiar it is, whether it's your first sermon or your 10,000th sermon, it needs to be relying on the Lord. Our service should be relying on him. Some of my fondest memories of ministry have been those days when I look ahead and just think, this is impossible. I was just remembering this evening, it was a Saturday night when everything was going wrong. We had problems with a geezer leaking, our daughter was sick, and then as Rachel and I were getting up to try to take care of her and change the bed sheets, she hit the door on her toe and cut the top of the skin off of it. And now we're, I'm trying to take care of her and our child, all these things at the same time. And then I'm supposed to teach the next morning at church. Lord, give me strength. I can't do this, right? And yet he does, and he did. And looking back on that afterwards was just such a testimony of his faithfulness to carry us through. Because I knew that wasn't me. I didn't have the strength to to push through all of those things and be able to keep going. But I knew that God did. 
God has the strength. He gives us the strength in abundance we need to serve. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that God's divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. The power to live a godly life is ours in Christ, that he gives us the means to live an obedient life. And I, I think of this, when we think of service, it's, it's sort of like being a deep sea diver with that air hose connected to a boat on the surface that's pumping air down to you so that you can go down and explore the depths of the sea. Imagine being that diver and thinking, you know what, I don't need the air hose today, and just jumping off the boat, (laughs) sinking down to the bottom. And you've got a little bit of air in that suit, you're probably going to go for, you know, a minute or two. But then the air gets thin and you start suffocating and you're going to be yanking on that rope needing to be pulled back to the surface, right? Because you don't have a supply of air to sustain you for long. And I think often our weariness in ministry is because of that, is because we are trying to rely on our own reserve of strength instead of God's. Ours is so limited. His is infinite. And instead of looking to him and letting him supply us with the grace and the strength that we need to serve him day by day, we rely on ourselves and we start to suffocate. Now, I also want to say that I recognize that there are different seasons of ministry, that they're not all the same. Just because you did all of these things when you were 18 doesn't mean you do all the same things when you have kids or you're caring for a a sick relative or or you're, you're aging or whatever, that there are different seasons with different requirements. In fact, I think sometimes we can pridefully overcommit ourselves and take on more responsibility and, again, be relying on our own strength there. And yet, the point is that God does supply us with strength to be able to serve and serve well, to be able to serve one another in many ways. And as we rely on him, he works through us, and we're able to look to him and praise him for the work that he does through us. And that really leads us to our third point. We've just seen that God empowers our service. Number three, God is glorified by our service. Continuing in verse 11. So that, in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This tells us that the purpose of our service is to glorify God. And when we serve, there can be a temptation to take the credit for ourselves, to believe that we've done something great, to believe that we've done something wonderful, and to want to be recognized by people. Yet, there's really no room to do that. Because as we've seen, the gifts that we have come from God. The words that we speak are from God. The strength that we serve from is from God. And as we recognize all of that, we see there's really no room for boasting at all. We can't take credit from that, and we shouldn't expect to be praised by other people for that, because it's really not about us. It's about God. And this should take the spotlight off of us and turn it to God, so that God is glorified. But I think we use that phrase so often in the church that it may be helpful to define what does it mean to glorify God through our service? What does that look like? So here are a few different examples of some of the ways, this isn't an exhaustive list, but some ways that we can glorify God as we serve. We glorify God, as I said a minute ago, by marveling at his work within us to do something we know we couldn't have done otherwise. You make it through that Sunday after that sleepless night and just say, wow, Lord, thank you. I praise you. That wasn't me. That was your work. Thank you for your grace. We also glorify God by remembering that we don't have any way to serve except for through his salvation. As we said earlier, these spiritual gifts are only given to believers, right? Apart from his grace in redeeming us, we couldn't do these things. We wouldn't have these gifts. But because he's given them to us, we're able to offer spiritual sacrifices, as Peter says in chapter 2, verse 5. Because of his salvation, we're able to bring him acceptable worship. We wouldn't otherwise. And that's something to praise him for. We also glorify God as he matures us through service. Service is such a great way to grow and to be matured, right? Sometimes we might think, well, I'll wait until I'm more mature, then I'll start getting involved in the church. But actually, you get involved, and that helps you to mature. We become more mature and more sanctified through service. 
Because what happens as you serve is you start to rely more on the Lord's strength and also he reveals your own weaknesses, your own sin, and you can confess those things and forsake them and put them aside, but also depend more on his grace to use you. And as you do that, you grow, become more like Christ. We praise God for that. We're not the only ones who glorify God. Others can also glorify God because they see Christ at work within us. Remember Jesus' example. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He himself came as a servant. And so when we serve, we're exemplifying Christ. We're showing the world what he looks like, and they can see that and praise God for that too. We also glorify God, and others glorify God whenever someone praises us for a job well done, right? Right? We hope we do that. We should encourage one another. We should, we should compliment each other for their work, but that gives us an opportunity to recognize that that work is really from God, right? I always have an opportunity when someone says to me after I preach, you know, great job, and I can either think highly of myself or I can praise God for his work through me. It's really from him. The power's from him. The strength's from him. The grace and the gifts are from him. We see that other believers glorify God as the body is built up. Think about all the different ways that each other connects to one another. As I serve one person, they serve this person, that person helps maybe serve me in a different way. And that in many ways, as we all exercise our gifts, we continue to strengthen and build up one another. And that brings lots of opportunities to worship God. And then Peter even highlights that unbelievers can come to glorify God. They can come to faith And glorify him, chapter 2, verse 12. He says, by seeing our godly life as Christians, unbelievers may come to repentance and may come to become worshipers of God. What an amazing thought that is, that our life as believers can bring people to salvation. He gives an example of that in chapter 3, verse 1, of a Christian wife whose husband is an unbeliever, and that through her godly life and example and conduct, that he may come to faith in Christ. Praise God for that. And there are many more examples of ways that we glorify God as we serve one another, but really the thing to understand is that our service should always point to him. That's what we're created for, to glorify God, and service is a great way to do that. I think it's tempting at times to think of service in the church just as a way to get things done. When you hear those announcements about need for someone to help with food or with cleanup, we think, yeah, they're just trying to find people to get work done. But it's not how we should think about it. Rather, those are invitations to be involved in God's work here on earth. I think God could have created the church to function without needing us. He could have created other ways for things to carry on, for his work to go forth without us. But we get the privilege of being involved in that. God is exalting himself in this world through the church, and we have the opportunity to be right in the middle of it. We get to serve under his banner. We get to bear his name. We get to be associated with that great work that he is doing. I love this quote by David Livingston, which highlights that. He writes, If a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? But we know that sometimes it does feel like a sacrifice. Sometimes we feel like it's a burden to serve And I think often that's really because we're focusing on the results that we want. I remember a season in in Malawi where I was teaching the youth group and there were only two kids who came. Steve, your son is one of them. (laughs) Two kids came and they were attentive, but I was really hoping for a lot more than that because I had spent six, eight hours preparing and this is what I got. And I began to get really discouraged, thinking, man, I I really wanted a lot more than this. Maybe we should just close this down, right? But what I had to remember was that that was still an opportunity to glorify God, right? My goal was not to teach so that I could have 100 kids there. My goal was to teach to glorify God and to help build these young people up. And praise God, that happens. No matter what the outcome is, that happens. God is glorified no matter what. That wasn't lost. That effort wasn't lost. Praise God, later, eventually the group did grow and I got to see some of that, but that's not a guarantee. But what we do know is that any time we serve, if we're serving to please the Lord, that he receives that praise and that it is something that he, uh, he will reward in the right time. 
Well, in conclusion, we've seen a right perspective on service and really how it's centered around God. We've seen three dynamics about service. Number one, God gives us all gifts for service. Two, God empowers our service. And three, God is glorified by our service. And I trust that these are an encouragement to you, no matter where you are. Again, we notice that it's so God-focused. Really, it's not about us. And it's not about the people that we're serving. We're secondary characters in what's happening here. The primary character is God. God is the one who's at work here, and we get to be used by him to build up his church. Wherever you are and you're thinking about service, whether you're involved or not involved, I hope that this turns your gaze to him and helps encourage your heart to worship him through service. Romans 11:36, familiar passage says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And one of those all things is service. And we see that exact model here. From him, God gives the gifts. Through him, he gives the strength in the words. And to him, for his glory, are all things. We glorify God through service so that he may be glorified. Please bow your heads as we pray together. Gracious God, giver of every good gift, we praise you for your grace. Lord, because of our sins, we have no right to ask anything of you, but because of your mercy alone, you give us the means to be forgiven. Lord, you make us acceptable in your sight. And as if that weren't enough, you give us grace upon grace, lavishing so much more upon us and making it possible for us to bear your name and be useful for your service, for your work. Lord, we look forward to the full fulfillment of all of these promises, Lord, but we also pray that you help us as we live in this broken world to be able to be faithful stewards of what you've entrusted to us. Lord, for anyone here who hasn't submitted to you as Savior and Lord, I pray that you might soften their hearts to repentance and faith, that they may behold the beauty of your grace. Lord, for those of us who you have saved, help us to be good stewards of the gift that you've given to each one of us. Help us to employ them to serve one another. Help us to to do that in a way that portrays your manifold grace. Help us not to speak our own words, but yours. Help us not to serve in our own strength, but in yours. Help us to take the spotlight off ourselves and onto you the giver of these gifts, the supplier of the strength, the one who's spoken these words, Lord, who enables all of these things. Lord, may we glorify you with our lives. Guide us, Lord, as each of us looks at our lives and our our role in your church and seeks to, to find how we can best employ the things that you've entrusted to us. Lord, that we may magnify you and shine forth those bright colors in this broken, dark, and crumbling world. Lord, that your name may be lifted high. We pray all of these things for your glory, Lord, and in your name. Amen. We'll ask you to please stand at this point for our benediction. Our benediction is from 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 10 and 11. It reads, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in grace.